Hey guys, what we're going to look at today is federalism and the, how the concept of federalism has changed throughout the years. Uh, with this lecture, we're just going to get all the way up until about the Industrial Revolution. We're going to be looking at uh, things that Washington, Adams, Jefferson had done, Andrew Jackson, uh, and then we will look at federalism and how it shifted uh, thanks to the Industrial Revolution. If you remember from the previous video, uh, we were looking at the whole idea of federalism, the sharing of powers, where we can find it in the Constitution, uh, the differences with the different types of powers, expressed or delegated, implied, inherent, reserved, denied. We had a, an assignment on that. We're going to look at, uh, we looked at the Tenth Amendment, which said any power not given to the federal government and not prohibited by the states are reserved to the states or for the states. But then we also know that there's some overlapping responsibilities. Uh, we looked at uh, marriage licenses. We looked at the Department of Education, elections, law enforcement, all sorts of different areas where it seems like the federal government and the states are involved with uh, these topics. But what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some examples, some court cases, some ideas on how the federal government navigated uh, this whole idea of federalism and sharing power. So today's topic, federalism through the years. Uh, with George Washington, he was unanimously elected president and a good chunk of the members of Congress were Federalists. And with Washington, the uh, politics was still divided between uh, the two uh, parties or the two factions with the Constitution, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And this is shaping us into our first true political parties, the Federalists and the Democrat Republicans. One big topic uh, was the creation of a national bank. Now, if you were to take out the Constitution, and I could take out my handy dandy pocket Constitution, and look in the Constitution and try to find where it says that the federal government has the power to create a national bank. It's not in here. Nowhere in here does it say that Congress or the federal government has the power to create a national bank. Alexander Hamilton said, as long as the Constitution doesn't forbid it, the federal government can do it. So as long as the Constitution doesn't say no, it's an allowable power by the federal government. Thomas Jefferson said no. Jefferson was a strict constructionist. If it doesn't say it in here, it's not allowed. And so we had this disagreement. Uh, between the Federalists and the Democrat Republicans, or those, the Washingtonians versus the Jeffersonians. And what are we going to do? You know, is it a power of Congress or is it not? So that was, that's going to uh, come up again uh, with a court case, McCulloch versus Maryland, that we will get to in just a couple minutes. Another event that occurred during Washington's time as president that deals with federalism is another rebellion that we call the Whiskey Rebellion. There were some uh, whiskey distillers who uh, didn't agree with a tax that was levied on their whiskey. And so they started rebelling. They said, we are not going to pay this federal tax. You don't have the right to tax this whiskey. And what does Washington do? He rounds up over 13,000 soldiers and really brutally crushes these distillers. They, he crushes these, uh, this rebellion. Uh, people are like, whoa, did the federal government just do this? Did Washington just send 13,000 soldiers to, to uh, put down a rebellion, to put down this protest uh, that was led by his fellow Americans, did he really do that? Crushed them? 
and it was brutal. It was a harsh, uh, a harsh crushing. And so a lot of people were like, this is not what we had in mind when we talked about the power of the federal government. Washington went a little too far, a lot of people thought. And this gave uh, the Jefferson camp, the anti-federalist camp, uh, a uh, more support. Because Thomas Jefferson is saying, I told you, I told you this is what was going to happen. The federal government's going to be too big. We got to stop it. And so uh, the Jefferson camp actually kind of gains in strength thanks to the Whiskey Rebellion. Washington serves two terms, uh, then steps down. And it was the election of 1796 was between John Adams, a Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson. John Adams barely beat Thomas Jefferson. In fact, let me pull this up real fast. It was a vote of 71 to 68 in the Electoral College. So it is a super close race, uh, which shows you that Thomas Jefferson, these anti-federalist groups, had a lot of power, had a lot of support, that it was not like everybody loved the Constitution and everybody loved what the federal government was doing. No, it was a bitterly contested race. And because we didn't have the 12th Amendment yet, uh, Thomas Jefferson was John Adams's vice president, which didn't help things out. But we know the vice president doesn't have too much power. So uh, John Adams continued on with his Federalist ways. One thing that was passed in Congress and signed by Adams was the Alien and Sedition Acts. This as basically set punishments for making false statements about the government. So it kind of, Thomas Jefferson's camp was like, whoa, don't we have the First Amendment? Don't we have the freedom of speech? And uh, John Adams was able to push through these laws that punish people for saying false things about the government, which strengthened Thomas Jefferson camp, Thomas Jefferson's camp even more. So Adams, Washington, Washington and Adams, they are uh, increasing the power of the federal government. They are pro-big government, pro-powerful government. Thomas Jefferson wasn't. We know uh, from the previous slide that he was a strict constructionist. He said, if it's not in the Constitution, we can't do it or the federal government can't do it. Thomas Jefferson developed a policy or a theory called the Compact Theory, in which he said, hey, 13 sovereign states came together and created this constitution. These 13 states created this federal government. We, in a sense, entered into a compact or a contract regarding its jurisdiction. We, Thomas Jefferson said, are allowing the federal government to exist. And since we created the national government, states can decide whether or not the government, the federal government, overstepped its authority. So that he believed that the states should have the right to decide for themselves whether or not the federal government was allowed to do something. This is going to evolve into the theory of nullification, uh, which was used by Southern states prior to the Civil War that said states could nullify or veto or, or overrule a federal law. In 1788, at, at the Virginia Ratification Convention for the Constitution, John Marshall uh, mentioned, he goes, is there anything that the federal government can't do? But he says, well, maybe, but the Supreme Court, the federal judicial branch, would declare any law that went against the Constitution unconstitutional. So he said, I'm a Federalist, but 
you know, anti-federalists, don't worry about anything. If the federal government tries to do something that they're not supposed to, the judicial branch would put them back in line. Well, right before Adams left, after being, uh, well, after, right before he lost the election, John Adams appointed John Marshall as the Chief Justice of the United States. So now we have the Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, as one of the leaders of the Federalist camp going against Thomas Jefferson. And in 1819, there is a court case, a very important court case on Federalism that reached the Supreme Court. And we call this McCulloch versus Maryland. Here's a brief background or a recap of this case. The federal government had a national bank. They had this charter, this uh, agreement to create the national bank. Well, one of the branches of the national bank was in Maryland. Maryland didn't like that. Maryland said there is nowhere in the Constitution that says the federal government can create a national bank. We, the state of Maryland, has the power to regulate the banking business. And so they passed a law saying that if you did not have a Maryland uh, authorization for a bank, you had to pay a tax of $15,000. This law was aimed directly at this national bank in Maryland. They wanted uh, the national bank to be out of Maryland. So they put this really huge tax on any bank not incorporated by the state of Maryland. They went uh, to the National Bank and talked to James McCulloch. Let me make sure I got this name right. James McCulloch, yes, uh, was the lead bank manager. He was the head cashier at the time. So he was the, the branch manager in a sense. Maryland went to collect their $15,000. They said, McCulloch, pay up. McCulloch says, no, I am part of the federal government. States can't tax the federal government, and they went to court over this argument. Court gets all the way to the Supreme Court, where John Marshall is the uh, Chief Justice, and guess what happens? Take a guess. Think about it. The Supreme Court said the federal government can do this. They can do this, and here's why. M Marshall says, take a look at Article 1, Section 8. It says, Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes. Congress has the power to borrow money and to coin money. Number five, they, uh, John Marshall also said, take a look at the last one. Congress can make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. So the court said in a six to zero decision, even though the Constitution doesn't specifically mention the word bank or national bank, it's assumed or it's necessary for the federal government to have a bank because they have the power to collect taxes, to coin money. All of those things deal with banking. And so uh, Article 1, Section 8 was a big thing. And then uh, with uh, the uh, necessary and proper clause, that's uh, where the, uh, the courts said that Congress can do things. They interpreted the necessary and proper clause. And then Article 6 of the Constitution has the supremacy clause. So the, federal, the state governments cannot tax the federal government. It's the whole idea of implied powers, those necessary and proper clause powers. And so this was a big case because it allowed, it specifically showed or specifically laid out that the federal government can do things that aren't specifically listed in the Constitution. That's Article 1, Section 8, Number 18, the necessary and proper clause. There's another case, uh, Gibbons versus Odgen, and this came in 1824. Uh, we'll look at this later, but the gist of it is, is that New York uh, gave a monopoly, gave a contract to a, uh, like a uh, 
to a company that could regulate all the waters, all the waterways inside the state lines of New York. One guy didn't want to get a, uh, a contract or a, get a license to do this, so he sued. So here we have the question of what is interstate commerce? Can the federal government regulate navigation? Once again, nowhere in the Constitution does it say that they could regulate navigable waterways. And there's these two arguments. New York says, hey, we have the right to handle things, all anything that happens within our state borders. So any type of trade that happens within our uh, borders is our jurisdiction. Congress just has the power to regulate interstate commerce. Well, the court said interstate commerce is more than just taking a product and taking it over state lines. They said it includes navigation. And so once again, the federal government, uh, the federal government's power has expanded thanks to the necessary and proper clause. With this, uh, uh, in the 1800s, 1820s, uh, with the Gibbons versus Odgen case, we had what we like to call dual federalism. This is where the, the federal government has its sphere of influence and the states have their own sphere of influence. Article 1 said the, uh, had the Interstate Commerce Clause, but it didn't say that the states couldn't regulate commerce or trade within their own borders. And so it's like kind of overlapping or what the title is, dual federalism. And so that's what we saw, or that's what uh, we will see uh, with federalism all the way up until uh, the Civil War Industrial Revolution time period, is that each, uh, the federal government and the states had their own system, that they had their own areas of jurisdiction. And it wasn't that big of a deal. Trade wasn't a huge thing. It was big, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't like it was with the Industrial Revolution and with railroads and all that. Uh, the, there's an idea called selective e exclusiveness that said the states can do what they want when it comes to trade for the most part. But if we need to create a uniform rule for all the states, the federal government's going to have that power. That uh, in order to make things consistent across state lines, the federal government has the power to regulate that. So one example would be, we could say, weights and measures. Uh, if we want everything to be consistent, and so with the doctrine or theory of selective exclusiveness, that uh, allows the federal government to regulate that area or that field. And like I said, it wasn't a big deal until the Industrial Revolution when we got this huge explosion with our economy and economic activity. But that's the whole idea of dual federalism. Each area, the federal government and the states have their own uh, areas of influence. I have up here spheres or spheres of influence. Over time, uh, the uh, society has changed, our economy has changed. And thanks to the Industrial Revolution, uh, more and more products were being sold. Uh, things kind of got messy with the Industrial Revolution, and that ushered in the era of the progressive movement in the early 1900s. Uh, we had a lot of laws, uh, a couple of amendments that were passed uh, that uh, relied on the Commerce Clause. And if you think about it, Let's look up in our handy dandy pocket constitution and see where in the constitution does it say uh, Congress has the power to uh, regulate workplace safety. Where is that in here? That Congress has the power to regulate uh, what can be put in uh, medicine, 
with the Pure Food and Drug Act. It's not in here. Nowhere. You can look and look and look. It's not there. However, Congress and the courts rely on Article 1, Section 3 to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. They're relying on the interstate commerce clause to regulate all these things. Even though the Constitution doesn't say it, they're using the commerce clause. And then at the very end, that catch all the necessary and proper clause to be able to do these things. We're going to stop here and uh, take a look uh, with a little bit more detail, uh, the court case McCulloch versus Maryland. It is, if you have to take a top 10 list of the most important Supreme Court cases ever, McCulloch versus Maryland is in that list. Uh, so we will stop here with the notes and take a look at McCulloch versus Maryland. Have a good day.